Welcome to this Sunday's edition of Grace Community Church Virtual Service. We're so happy that you're here. We hope everything is going really well in your life. God loves you. God wants to bless you. We pray that the worship will uplift your heart and the word will provide guidance for your life. Thank you so much for being here. We really appreciate you. Father, we come before you this morning, and you know that we are full of need for you, but the world over, there are so many people who need to know you, who need to know your love, to know what it feels like to have faith, to not see the frets of the world and let it get to them. And we just pray that, can we be that light? Can you help us be that light to shine your love, to shine that faith? to be a comfort to other people, to know that you are reigning over everything. You have the way planned. You made provision for us to have forgiveness for everything we've ever done wrong. His name is Jesus, and we're just, everything that we do, we want to honor him. Thank you for letting us have church and to do worship and listen to the word. It is truly such an honor. We love you and pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. The Stand. Oh, no. 
Please join me as we pray for our offering for this Sunday. We thank you, Lord, for the faithful support of your people for the ministry of Grace Community Church. We also pray, Lord, that you would help us to understand that the investment in the kingdom of God is an investment that may not see all of its return yet. The full return of the investment in the kingdom of God and the church of God on earth will not be realized until we are in eternity, when we see the full result of all of the investment of time, money, energy, gifts, involvement. We won't see all of that until we're over there. So we know what we're doing here, as it says in the book of Timothy, is we are storing up treasure. It is growing. It is a growing investment. We fully expect financial investments here on earth to grow, Investments with with you, they grow in exponential ways that we cannot even begin to understand yet. Some of us look very meticulously at our retirement accounts to see how much is being accumulated and to see how much interest it is earned and to see how much it is compounding. If you would let us see how much is compounded in heaven, I think all of us would give all that we can to you, not just in money, but in time in involvement, in energy, in being part of what you are doing. Bless your people. Bless their gifts. Bless them in their work. Bless them in their needs. In Jesus' name, amen. I am not alone.
Welcome back. Happy Father's Day to all of you fathers out there. Uh, I did not prepare a Father's Day sermon because I didn't want to lose the momentum on John chapter 8. So we're just going to continue in it. However, suffice it to say this, the relationship between father and son and father and daughter is the relationship that changed all of eternity. Jesus Christ is God's only begotten son and The Father, God the Father, sent his Son because he loved the world. Um, I encourage all of you to strengthen your relationships with your children, with your, your spouse, with your family, because that's what everything is built on. That's what God has built all of creation on. If you think about Father, God, and Son, Jesus Christ. So let's pray. We thank you, Lord, for the fact that in the Bible, you are called our Father in heaven. We pause as a nation to reflect and to celebrate fathers, and we call it Father's Day. But since you're the ultimate father, we ask that somehow our lives would be a Father's Day card, a Father's Day gift to you, and that our manner of living and the way we conduct ourselves. Our examples might be examples to other generations and to our own families. We need that more than ever now. So Lord, help us as we look into your word and as we look into how your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, came and discoursed on earth with people and taught so that there would be lessons that could be looked at through generations how God interacted with man while he was here on earth and how man showed himself to be sinful and that in your redemption, somehow you're able to cut through all of that and even save us from that. Forgive us for being doubtful, argumentative, unbelieving, faithless, sinful, carnal, and give to us your grace and your mercy to have a new day with you, Open our hearts, open our minds to the word as we look at the rest of your discussion with the Pharisees while you were here on earth before you were crucified. Amen. So take your sermon notes, please, and follow along to the light of the world, part two. And in this part of the discussion that Jesus had with the leadership of the Jewish people, valuable lessons can be learned. So as light gives us Clarity to see things in the physical realm. The light of God gives us clarity to see things in spiritual realms. That is to say, and what I mean by spiritual is the real how-tos about life. How to have a better relationship with my wife, with my kids, at my work, in my business, with my friends, etc. God teaches you, if you're willing to listen, how to live your lives. Let's listen to him. We've listened way too much to other so-called experts who are supposed to know everything, but let's listen to the Word of God because it's fresh all the time. The light of Jesus' Word frees us from spiritual bondage. It is in the instruction of the Word of God that you and I as human beings are given an information, a download from heaven that brings a clarity to life and existence that cannot be found in other uh, realms. Many teachings and many political movements and social movements and um, 
religious movements, they, they lack, they fail. Jesus said, you'll know a fruit by its tree. All you have to do is look at what has been produced by some of the philosophies that were uh, embraced by the world in history. And you'll see that it brought a lot of misery and a lot of death. So let's look at the word of God, because when you look at the word of God, you'll have a freedom. And this is what the founding fathers of America saw, that God gave us rights, freedom, liberty, pursuit of happiness, but these rights are endowed to us by our maker. So we need to know who our maker is. And the way you know is by studying about him in the word. Many of you more purist constitutionalists and, if you will, patriots, don't forget this. Never get your eyes off of where it all came from. It didn't just come from Jefferson and Franklin and Washington and John Adams. It came from the word of God. So let's look. Then said Jesus to those Jewish leaders, which believed uh, to those Jewish people who believed on him. If you continue in my word, then you are my disciples indeed. And you will know the truth and the truth shall make you free. This statement is really, really amazing. Because when you and I listen to Jesus Christ's teachings, they are individually freeing because they free us from our bondage to sin. They free us from bondage to ignorance. They, and I'm talking about the kind of ignorance that comes with religions, man-made religions, and even the kinds of religions that we make up in our own heads. When you listen to the Bible, it cuts through all of that. The Bible says in Hebrews that the word of God is like a two-edged sword. It cuts through and make sense of everything. So let's listen to the Lord, okay? He's saying, if you continue in my word. And I'm glad he said that because a lot of people trust in the fact that, oh, I prayed for Jesus to come into my heart, and then that's it. And may I say to you, as old Dr. Ver Vernon McGee used to say, may I say that if you only trust in you, walking down the aisle one time a long time ago, and you never gave yourself to discipleship, to learning, to instruction, to Bible study, then you are lacking. You must continue in his word. That is to say, yes, make a commitment to follow Jesus. Yes, um, accept him as Savior. But then go the next thing, the next step. Get into the word, learn. There's no excuse not to learn anymore. There's phenomenal tools now in order to learn the word of God. If you say it's too hard, it's not that it's too hard. A lot of people say it's hard to follow God. I'd like to suggest to you that it's harder not to follow God because the people that I have known in my life that decided not to follow God, their lives have become very difficult. And the people that followed God, it doesn't mean that they had no difficulties. It doesn't mean that they had no struggles or faced no failure. It just means that they had God in their lives and they were committed to him and he has helped them through all things. You need to continue in his word. Then you will prove to be his disciples and the truth will make you free. What is this freedom he's talking about? Freedom is bantied about a lot as a word that is uh, freedom from anything. That's anarchy. Freedom in the sense that knowing the difference between that which is false and that which is true. By knowing what sin is around me and in me so that I can deal with it rightly. That makes you free. Ultimately, you're free from the bondage of the enemy, Satan, who with his doctrines of demons, as the Bible says in Timothy, that in the last days they will pay attention to doctrines of demons which I have maintained our teachings of Marxism, evolutionism, atheism, agnosticism, all of these isms that are anti-God, anti-Christ. We need the freedom of the word of God. So the light of his word, the word, and that is, let me qualify the word, the teachings and the instructions of Jesus has found in the Bible. That's what frees you from spiritual bondage. Now, the next point is that we human beings have a tendency, all of us do, I do too. 
to trust in our own heritage instead of the word of the Lord. And what I mean by that is our own understanding, religiously, spiritually, our own intellect, our family's history, our nation's history. And um, you need to understand that that's dangerous because you need to trust the word of the Lord. Because many, many times in human history, it's been proven that institutions start off really well, but they all tend towards uh, dissolution. It's kind of like the second law of thermodynamics, but spiritually speaking, it tends towards disorder and it tends towards uh, coming off of the mark. It goes off of the rails. Many churches, many denominations have done that. Many real good institutions that used to be right on are way off now. We need to trust in the word of the Lord. Jesus, they answered him in John 8, 33. We are Abraham's seed. They're trusting in their heritage to the Jewish people. They are Jews. They trust in that. They trust in their connection to that. They trust in their DNA to Abraham. And we're never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, ye shall be made free? That statement in and of itself is untrue because the Jewish people many times were oppressed by many different entities, the Romans, the Greeks, the Egyptians, the Canaanites, the etc., etc. We all need to be made free, and it's not just from oppressors in a human realm. We need to be free in a spiritual sense because that's when true freedom comes. Because even if you're humanly oppressed by someone, if you know the Lord, you're free even if they throw you in a jail cell. Just look up the story of Richard Wormbrand, who was a priest behind the Iron Curtain. He was a Romanian, Roman Catholic priest. And when the communists came in, they put him in solitary confinement. And they didn't allow him to talk to anybody. And they told him that his wife had betrayed him. It was all untrue. He was free. He knew the Lord no matter what. You will be free. Don't trust in your own understanding of things. Don't trust in your own interpretation of things. Trust in the word of the Lord and you will be free. Now, our deepest need as human beings is freedom from sin. It's our deepest need. All other things are secondary needs. The need for food and clothing and housing and happiness and and money and all of these things. They're needs, yes. And God knows that you need them. Jesus said that to the disciples. Your heavenly Father knows that you need all of these things. Do not worry about what you will eat, what you will wear. You can read about that in the other Gospels. Matthew and Mark. But our deepest need, and God knew it, and God still knows it, is freedom from sin, freedom from spiritual deceit. We need this. So Jesus answers them, Verily, verily, I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. So he's talking about freedom from sin, spiritual bondage, not human oppression, not the Romans oppressing them, but them being oppressed by false teaching. And the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the son abides forever. So if the son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. So what is he saying here? We need a relationship with the son. Who is the son? Jesus. He. What son is he? He is the son of God, the only begotten son of God. And when you come into relationship with him, he is saying, that he will allow you in the household of God because God has a household. He is the greatest being that there is after all. There are angels surrounding him and to be part of his household, you have to be with the son. And when you come with and through the son into the household of God, you are now a fellow heir with the son. So now you are family with God and you abide in the household of God forever because God never dies. It's really cool. It's your deepest need. If you have never given your life to Jesus Christ, I encourage you, give your life to Jesus Christ. You'll never be disappointed. You can give your life to Buddha, to Mohammed, to Islam, to Charles Darwin, to the Republican Party, to the Democrat Party, to the Green Party. I don't know what you want to give your life to, but you'll always be disappointed because they're finite. They are not eternal When you give your life to Jesus Christ, nothing can shake you. The light of Jesus' word reveals the darkness of our sin nature. 
when you get into the Bible and the teachings of the Word of God, one of the th- one of the things that happens to you, James said this. It's like a mirror. The word of God's like a mirror. You look in it and you see yourself for what you are. So a lot of people they read the Bible, they get scared of it, they put it down, they don't want to look at it anymore because it gives you standards that are beyond human ability to live up to. It gives you the revelation of God and heaven and hell. It's very almost scary and sobering. So a lot of people are afraid. To deal with the Bible. But when you let the word of God come into you. It will reveal the extent of sin in you. And the Bible reveals that the sin nature that is in us. Goes all the way down into the spiritual part of our being. It's not just in the DNA physically. It is in our spiritual DNA as well. He says this Jesus in response to them claiming to be descendants of Abraham. He doesn't deny it. He says, I know you're Abraham's seed. Yes, you have the DNA of Jewish people. You can trace your lineage back to Abraham. But you seek to kill me because my word hath no place in you. They didn't like him. They didn't like him because he was gaining favor with the people. They didn't like him because he was showing mercy to sinners. They didn't like him because he was threatening their position, threatening their influence, probably even if in their minds, threatening their livelihoods, although they were wrong and all of that. God doesn't threaten you. Letting him into your life doesn't threaten you. He's not going to take away your fun. He's going to add to your fun. He's going to add quality to your life that you never dreamed even possible. It's going to be an eternal quality of life, not just temporal. I speak that which I have seen with my father. Ye do not do, you you do what you have seen your father do. They answered him and they said, Abraham's our father. Abraham's our father. And Jesus said unto them, if you were Abraham's children, you would do the work of Abraham. You would live like Abraham. But now you are seeking to kill me, a man that has told you the truth. Ah, which I have heard from God. And look what he says here. I love this. Abraham did not do this. Did not do what? He didn't go after people who stood for God. He did not go after people and assault people who tried to teach the things of God to people, who represented the things of God to people. Now, Kizedek came, read the book of Genesis, and he was called the high priest of God from what was the old, old, old Jerusalem, was called Salem at that point. Melchizedek, the great high priest, came, and Abraham offered a tenth to him. Abraham did not go after those who represented the the eternal God. But these people were, they were going after Jesus. They saw the miracles he had done. They had heard him about him resurrecting people from the dead, driving demons out of people. They had heard of him doing all of the miraculous things that he was doing. And yet they were still going after him because they didn't like what he represented, thereby proving the depth of sin that is in them, which we all have. A lot of us read this in the Bible and we think to ourselves, oh, how awful that they can be like this without realizing that you and me, we're all just like this. Left to ourselves, we would be just as murderous as the Pharisees were when they put Jesus on the cross. The extent of human sin goes all the way down deep into your spiritual DNA. And God knows this. That's why I said a minute ago that our deepest need is to be forgiven of sin. And he has made a way for that. Now, love for God, love for the God of the Bible. I wanted to qualify that because a lot of people say, I love God. But it is a God that is not the God of the Bible. It is a God of their own making. They have defined God the way they want God to be. Love for God, the God of the Bible. It always reveals one thing, love for Jesus. If you love God, you're going to love Jesus. If you love the God of the Bible, you will come to love Jesus Christ. Because Jesus Christ is the answer from the God of the Bible to our condition as human beings. Again in John 8, 41. You do the deeds of your father. Then said they to him, we be not born of fornication. We have one father, even God. 
You have to read between the lines here. You have to understand the whole story of Jesus and the Jewish leadership. They know where Jesus came from. They knew. They knew that Joseph had to marry Mary and that she was expecting a child before marriage. They are tongue-in-cheek taking a jab at the Son of God, not understanding that Mary was conceived of the Holy Spirit, but Jesus was conceived in Mary of the Holy Spirit. It wasn't fornication. It wasn't that Joseph and Mary couldn't wait and then had to get married. Joseph didn't even want to marry her when she found he found out she was pregnant. But an angel told him, don't be afraid to take her into your house. So Jesus, I mean, Jesus' stepfather, if you will, Joseph, he took Mary into his house and he bore the public humiliation of people thinking wrongly that they had fornicated. We have one father, even God, we're not like you. Say, so, yeah, I don't know if that's a correct interpretation of that. I, I think it is. I do. I think they were taking a swing at Jesus Christ. So Jesus said to them, if God, the God of the Bible, if the God that you say you believe in, if he really was your father, you would love me. For I came from God. I proceeded forth and came from him. Neither came I of myself. He sent me, John three sixteen. God so loved the world, he sent his son. So when I say that you love the God of the Bible, if you really say you love God, you're going to love Jesus. Because if you don't love Jesus, it means you don't love God. So don't go around saying, I love God. You might love some God of your own making, but if you don't love Jesus, you don't love God. And to love God means to accept what he has done and to receive what he has put forth as the answer to our issues. And the answer is Jesus Christ. Now, the impulse to hate and reject Jesus is a satanically originated one. In the parable of the soils, Jesus said that the seed is the word of God. And some of it fell on stony ground. And the birds came and snatched it up. And when they asked him, what does this mean? The disciples, he said, those who he who heard the word of God are the stony ground. Those who heard the word of God are the stony ground. They heard it, but the devil comes and snatches it from them. And they don't even listen to it. So if you have this immediate impulse to, nah, I don't want to listen to that Bible stuff, that Jesus stuff, that Christian stuff. I want you to hear this. If you don't hear anything out else out there, listen, listen, listen to this. There is an enemy of your soul. His name is Lucifer, Satan, the dragon, the devil. There's many different names from her for him, Apollyon. He is a being that does not want you to know truth. So when the word of God is being te- taught and preached and, and expounded to somebody, do you know who's really behind getting in the way of it? It's not just your own thinking. The enemy of your own soul doesn't want you to hear because when you hear and you let your ears be opened, when you let God sow the seed into your heart, then you will be saved and he will lose influence over you. So he, he is always active. The Bible says later on this, that Satan has blinded the mind of the unbelievers so that they will not believe. If you have been blinded, if you're one of those listening out there, and I hope one day you'll, you'll hear this sermon, somebody will say, you got to listen to this. They're, they're wanting you to listen to this because you're hearing maybe for the first time that the one that is present, preventing you from hearing this message or any message that is true from the Bible is a being that is an angel being from outside of this world. And he doesn't want you to hear the truth of the Bible because it'll set you free. Why do you not understand my words? Jesus keeps on in his discussion with them. And the reason all of this is in the Bible isn't to show us this conflict that happened between Jesus and the leaders the leaders of the Israelite people 2,000 years ago. It is to show us human nature. It is to show all of us what's going on all around us all the time. When you don't understand what Jesus is saying, it's because of something. It's because he cannot hear my word, he said, because ye cannot hear my word. You cannot hear. In other words, you're deaf. 
You're deaf. You can't hear Jesus and God. And why are you spiritually deaf? And why can't you hear? It's because of the devil. It says this, you are of your father, the devil, and the lust of your father you will do. The devil will not let you hear. He wants to keep your ears muffled. He wants to keep his hands over your ears so that you don't hear, spiritually speaking. No, no, try anything. Just don't try Jesus. All right, you want to be a good Buddhist? I'll let you be a Buddhist. You want to be a a Muslim? I'll let you be a Muslim. You want to believe in evolution? Fine. You want to believe in anything else? Fine. Just don't listen to Jesus stuff. That's from the enemy of your soul. Because the moment you listen to Jesus stuff, your soul suddenly is unplugged. I love science fiction, and there's an old science fiction movie, The Matrix. It's up to you. You want to stay plugged into the lighting system, or do you want to unplug and find out what's really going down? A war, a battle, a spiritual conflict that originated before the world was created, and it is led by Satan, who is leading a war against God. He cannot win, but he sure thinks he can. He was a murderer from the beginning. Jesus revealing, if you will, pulling back the covers from the nature of this being. Why is he doing this? Because later on in the New Testament, Paul the Apostle says this of him. He masquerades as an angel of light. That is to say that in his presentation to human beings and his doctrines and his teachings, he's trying to be erudite, academic, exclusive, uh, a higher being, all of this stuff. He acts like he's something that he's not. But Jesus is saying this. He, Lucifer, the devil, he was a murderer from the beginning. What beginning? Well, Genesis, that word means beginnings. Genesis, you see the serpent. And what is he doing? Casting doubt and aspersions upon God and his character and his word. He's always been that way. He always goes against God and he is a murderer. What's a murderer? Someone who takes a life that is not his to take. And it says this, he abode not in the truth. That means he did not stay in the truth. He did not abide in the truth. Before he became the devil, he was one of the holy angels. He decided to go his own way. He did not stay with the truth of God. What is the truth? Jesus said this, I am the way, the truth, and the life. God is truth. He did not abide with God. He is a rebeller against God. And he leads a rebellion against God. And if you don't turn to God, you are part of his rebellion. Because there is no truth in him. In Greek, there is no veritas in Latin, rather. There's no veritas. There's no truth in him. When he offers you something, like he told Jesus Christ, I'll give you all of the glory of all of the kingdoms of the world are mine. That was a lie. There's no truth in that. He cannot give anything to anybody. All he can do is steal from you. Steal what? Your soul, the truth, your eternal destiny. When he speaks a lie, he speaks of his own. For he, Satan, Lucifer, the dragon, Apollyon, he is a liar and the father of lies. We're living in a time in human history that the Bible prophesied would come. When men would listen to false teachings rather than truth. When men would rather have people tickle their ears and tell them what they want to hear instead of what they need to hear. And what do people want to hear? There is no God. There is no hell. There is no heaven. There is no afterlife. There is no sin. Live however you want. Do whatever you want. Say whatever you want. It's okay. There's no consequence. And all of that's a lie. That's like saying to somebody, why don't you stick your hand in the fire? It won't burn. But we're hopefully still smart enough to know that that's not true. It's kind of funny that when you go buy something nowadays, everything has a warning. You buy a skill saw, they say, don't put your finger in the blade. Well, duh. Put your fingers in the blade of a skill saw. You're not going to have any more fingers, right? But we have to say that nowadays because people are so dense, all of us. When he speaks a lie, he speaks of his own, for he's a liar and the father of it. This discussion is apropos even for now because now we live in the era of fake news and Donald Trump did coin that phrase. Fake information came way back in the book of Genesis. The the father of fake news is Lucifer. It's the devil and you and I need a spiritual power that will help us to see what's truth and what's not and you cannot get that without God. 
Now, those who reject the word of the Lord, and I'm fully aware that might be somebody out there who you're in that state right now, because I sat that, that way once. I didn't believe the Bible. I didn't believe God. I didn't believe Jesus. When you reject the word of the Lord, you're not of God. And I remember that in my life. I remember not having God in my life. I remember not submitting myself or listening or learning from the Bible and the word of the Lord. So that could be you. And if that is you, I would ask you to turn your life to him. Because I tell you the truth, you believe me not. Even though we proclaim and we teach and we preach, some of us that are blue in the face. A lot of people won't believe. Which of you convinceth me of sin? Convicteth me of sin? And if I say the truth, why do you not believe me? He that is of God heareth God's words. Ye therefore hear them not, because ye are not of God. So to reject the word of God, the word of Jesus, reveals that you're not of God. Don't reject the word of the Lord. The word of the Lord is found in only one place. Here it is. It's in the Bible. Read it for yourself. He'll show you. The Lord honored the Father. He honored the Father in the way today's Father's Day. If you want to honor the Father, I preach this on Mother's Day. If you want to honor your mom and your dad, honor them by serving um, their memory if they're not here anymore, by living a life that is a life that can be looked at in eternity as something that was good. Honor them that way. The Lord honored the Father, God the Father, by reconciling all people. How did he honor God? By doing what God expected him and wanted him to do. God so loved the world, he sent his son. He sent them to do what? Reconcile the world to himself. Give himself for the world. What's what happens here in this discussion? The Jewish leadership answered him, aren't we right in saying, you are a Samaritan and demon possessed? That's a racist statement. We're all into uh, up in arms nowadays about racism. Racism has existed since Satan came in and divided us. He made us distrust God. Racism has its origins in Satan. We're all human beings, okay? doesn't matter what, what background or culture or language or color or skin you have, whether you're short or tall or not, or skinny or not skinny. It's interesting that for some reason we're able to say things against people that seem okay, but when it comes to other things, we can't in today's culture. I've heard people uh, say that big fat president. Really? I know some people who have weight issues. I've got a little bit of a weight issue. Can you call me a big fat preacher? Maybe I am. But that's my issue between me and God to deal with. Personal struggle. They're calling him a Samaritan. A Samaritan was a racial group, a, an ethnic group that weren't Jewish. They were transplanted by the Assyrian king into the old northern kingdom of Israel. They were a mixed group of all kinds of different uh, ethnic background people. But they did believe in the God of uh, the Jewish people. But the Jewish people themselves did not like them. So they insult them and they call Jesus one. You're a Samaritan. They know he's Jewish. His mom and dad were real Jewish people. They were registered. Okay. They registered as Jews in Bethlehem. But they're insulting him and they're using a racial slur to do it. And then they go even further. You're demon possessed. This has been going on since the get go people. But again, I say to you, it doesn't give us the right to go around burning everything down. That God will deal with. You might get away with it here on earth, but don't worry, God has a record of it. I am not possessed by a demon, said Jesus. But I honor my father and you dishonor me. They actually were accusing him of having a demon, but what he had in him was the Holy Spirit. Should I say who he had? I am not seeking glory for myself, but there is one who seeks it and he is the judge. This is an amazing thing. The Lord honored the Father. How did he do this? By reconciling all people. If you look at his ministry on earth, he's one of the first, I should say, he's probably the first Jewish people that actually reached out 
to a non-Jewish person to tell them about the eternal salvation that is offered through the Jewish people. And in, earlier in the Gospel of John, he offered it to the Samaritan woman. So they looked at all of that camaraderie, quote unquote, that he had with Samaritans and he talked to tax collectors and sinners and uh, Romans. He let a Roman come in and he healed his son. They didn't like that. Interesting, don't you think? That we think that our group is the group, but we're all human. We all need salvation. We all have common needs. I love what he says here. I'm not seeking glory for myself. There is one who seeks it. He's the judge. The next point is that God is the God of the living. He says this, if anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. At this, the Jews exclaimed, now we know you're demon possessed. Why? Because of what they heard him just say. And when you keep his word, you never see death. They don't believe this. So they say you're demon possessed for sure. You're crazy is what they're saying. And now here's their reasoning. Abraham died and so did the prophets. Yet you say if anyone keeps your word, you'll never, you'll never taste death. Are you greater than our father Abraham? He died and so did the prophets. Who do you think you are? So their emphasis is this, that Abraham died and the prophets died. They all lived in the past. They're dead. And you are saying that if somebody keeps your teaching, we have Abraham's writings, we have the prophets' writings, and you're saying that if we keep your teaching, we'll never die. But yet the prophets themselves have died, and so is Abraham, the founder of the Jewish people. He's dead. But they're forgetting something. Matthew chapter 22. In Matthew chapter 22, verse 32. Jesus Christ is asked about the resurrection by somebody who thought he could corner him, one of the leaders. And they gave him this huge story about a woman that had seven husbands and they all died and then she died. So who's going to be her husband? Whose wife is she going to be in heaven? And he says, you err and you do not know the scriptures. Because in heaven they will be like the angels. They'll neither get married nor be given in marriage. We're going to no need for marriage in heaven. Why? Because we're all going to love each other perfectly. No ulterior motives. No running running away with somebody else. That doesn't happen. There, everything will be 100% love, 100% pure without sin. Well, we won't need marriage. There won't be no procreation there anymore. Oh, no. No more fun. There'll be a lot of fun. Don't worry. Different kind of fun. Fun that you can't even imagine. If the fun that he has given us here on planet Earth is fun, can you imagine there? Can you imagine the kinds of things that he has prepared for us? It says that we can't even tell you what we have seen. So he said this in Matthew twenty-two thirty-two. 32. Have you never read about the resurrection that God says, I am the God of Abraham. I am the God of Jacob. I am the God of Isaac. Every time he identified himself in the Old Testament, that's the way he identified himself. When he appeared to Moses at the burning bush, I am the God of Abraham. I am the God of Isaac. I am the God of Jacob. Yet they were all gone already. And that's what these guys, these guys, these these leaders, these teachers of the Jewish people are saying. They're all dead. Abraham and the prophets are all dead. And Jesus says this, God identifies himself as their God in the present tense. God is not the God of the dead, but the living. That is to say that Abraham and the prophets, all of them have lived and died physically, but they are still alive. Because the Bible reveals this, whoever believes in the one true God and his Savior Jesus Christ, he who believes in me, yet even if he dies, yet shall he live. He has crossed over from death to life. So Abraham is as much alive or even more so now than he ever was while he was here on earth. God is the God of the living. So when Jesus says that if you believe in my word, you will never taste death, he is not pulling that out of the hat. It's not a new teaching. It's all over the scriptures. Who do you think they are? They ask him. Well, they're about to find out. Being found in appearance as a man, he, Jesus, humbled himself. It says this in Philippians 2 verse 8. What does it mean to humble oneself? It means to abase oneself, to put the will of God in front of your own will, something that Adam did not do. 
something that Jesus did do. I'm going to show you in this. It's really cool watching the next part of the passage. Jesus replied, if I glorify myself, my glory means nothing. That statement is a statement of a man who actually did humble himself. He didn't just say it. He did it. The Bible says in Philippians 2.8, which I just read to you, that he was exalted to the highest place because he humbled himself. So if you want to take a lesson about humility and being the kind of person that you need to be, the Bible presents this teaching in this fashion. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, and in due time he, God, will exalt you. If you glorify yourself, if you seek to glorify yourself and be important yourself in front of people or even in your mind in front of God, then you're simply only going to find yourself to be temporarily glorified only. The Antichrist is going to glorify himself and call himself God, the Bible says. But that's only for a short time that he'll succeed in that because there's only one God. And the Bible says that God has declared that he will share his glory with no other. And Jesus reveals to us the very nature of God and that God is a humble God and he humbled himself to redeem us. My father, this return to the text, whom you claim as your God is the one who glorifies me. Who is it that you should be living for? God. Who is it that's really watching you? God. Who is it that has your back? God. Who is it that has your future? God. You can trust him. Even if you're in a situation or in a circumstance that seems to not be as rewarding as you think it should be, trust him. He will in time, in due time, do what needs to be done. Maybe and even in this life, you might never see all of the reward that you're going to receive. I shouldn't say might, you won't. It's not till there that we finally see it and experience it. Glorification is coming. But right now, it's cross-bearing time. As one old famous preacher said, it's not crown wearing time. Now it is time for pick up your cross, as Jesus said, and follow me. Continuing the text, though you know, though you do not know him. You don't know the God who glorifies me, my father. You say you love him, but you don't know him. If I said I did not know him, I would be a liar like you. (laughs) He's turning the tables here. He's calling them liars. What's a liar? Somebody who doesn't tell the truth. Somebody who says, this is true, but it's not. And they're so convinced that what they're saying is true, that they believe their own lie. And that's what we're living in now. People believing anything and everything except for God and his Bible. Jesus said it this way. In the end of time, it'll be like in the days of Noah. What was the days of Noah? Eight people were left that survived the flood. Eight people out of a planet of billions. But I do not know, but I do know him and I keep his word, Jesus said. Darkness, Jesus in this teaching said, I am the light of the world. Darkness cannot find the light. It says in the Gospel of John, chapter one, darkness could not comprehend it. In some translations, it says, darkness could not overcome it. Darkness can't find light. It cannot obtain it. Light comes into darkness and darkness goes away. Darkness cannot, in the physical realm even, overcome light. Watch what happens next in the story. Your father Abraham rejoiced at the thought of seeing my day. How could Abraham have rejoiced at thinking about Jesus coming? Because he knew what God was promising. God promised him. That through him, all of the nations of the world would be blessed. Abraham rejoiced in that. He saw it and he was glad. You are not yet 50 years old, the Jew said to him, and you have seen Abraham? I tell you the truth, Jesus answered, and this is a statement that is. It is the, the straw that broke the camel's back for Jesus while he was here on earth because he's claiming something here that his enemies knew what he was claiming. Before Abraham was born, I am. That to them is blasphemous. They picked up stones to stone him, but Jesus hid himself slipping away from the temple grounds. 
The, the, to them, that's blasphemy because to say I am is to use the name of God on Mount Sinai, to use the name of the God inside the burning bush. I am that I am. Jesus is saying this. I am. Before Abraham was born, I existed. Who is Jesus? They asked him this. Who do you think you are? I am. That's who I am. When you look at Jesus Christ, you're looking at God. When you follow Jesus Christ, you're following God. When you don't follow Jesus Christ, you're not following God. When you say you believe in God and you serve God and you follow God, but you don't believe in the Jesus stuff and the Christian stuff and his church thing, then you don't love God because Jesus gave his life for the church. You must love the church if you want to love God. You must love the people of God's church if you want to love God. He must come in and serve amongst the people that you wouldn't normally associate with. They're not going to be people that go to the opera. They're not going to be people that are influential and powerful and political and rich and educated and erudite. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians that God has chosen the foolish things of the world, the lowly things of the world, the outcasts of the world. Why did he choose them? Why doesn't he choose the powerful and the rich and the influential? He could change the world with them, couldn't he? Well, look what they're doing to us right now. No, you need to get involved with God and his humble people. You'll never be disappointed with that. I encourage you. Let us pray. We thank you for being the light of the world. And we thank you that in this light, we have light. We have the light of the life, the light that shows us what life is all about and where we are going, who we are, who you are, who the devil is. You have revealed it. It is there for anyone to see if they care. It's not a conspiracy theory. It is a spiritual war that has been going on since before the creation between you and Lucifer and his demons. And we find ourselves caught up in the midst of it all. But now because of you, we have armor. We have weapons. We have ability to know what to do and how to do it. We don't know exactly where we're at in your plan, oh God. Where we are at and concerning your return to earth. Some say it's right around the corner. Others say it is still a ways off. While you told the disciples, it is not for you to know the times or the dates set by my Father in heaven. You go and you be witnesses of mine. So that's what we want to do, Lord. We need to be your witnesses. Help us to be your witnesses. Whether we're black or yellow or brown or red or white or green or purple, whatever we are. Help us, Lord, or man, or woman, or young, or old, or rich, or poor, or American, or not, or Republican, or Democrat. All of these labels that divide us. Help us, Lord, to serve you and not label ourselves with something. To simply be called servants of the Most High God. Amen. In the sweet by and by.
Thank you so much for watching this Sunday's service with us. Grace Community Church wants to tell you that we appreciate you. You can watch this video or any of our videos at any time, share them with your friends or family. You can follow us on Facebook, like us on YouTube, and subscribe to our channel. Thank you so much. God bless you. Have a wonderful week, and we'll see you next time. Really? Like straight?